initially put online in 1916. So that makes this powerhouse a little over 100 years old now. There's nothing complex about this powerhouse. It's just simple, old school water wheel technology. Um, a lot of the components in the powerhouse are 100 years old. There are things that we have to replace from time to time uh, because simply materials don't last 100 years. Pipes don't last 100 years, things like that. So for those of you going into engineering, start thinking about how can I make this last 100 years. So I'm probably around. Um, this powerhouse is capable of producing 12 megawatts of power. On the scale of things, it's not a lot of power. Compared to a lot of micro hydro, it's a lot of power. We're capable of carrying everyone here at June Lake and north of this powerhouse. So that's about uh, 10,000 customers. Uh, does any, can anyone tell me what the byproduct of making power with water is? Uh, steam. Water. Steam? Water. Nothing. <laughs> no byproducts, nothing coming out of this plant. Very clean, efficient energy. When the water comes down, we have three reservoirs that feed this powerhouse. Uh, they're all in a chain. The first one is, where's Kelsey? She's still right behind <laughs> well, you. Well, she went over here. But she went over Wall, here. Wall Lake, Wall Lake. We call it Rush Meadows because we were here first. That's what we called it. Somebody changed it on the map later on. It's called Wall Lake now. It's at about 94, 9,500 feet elevation about 500 acres for the water. The next lake down is our biggest one. That's Gem Lake, G E M. Everybody wants a That's 17,000 acre feet, and I usually generate off that head. When I say a head, that means pressure, or PSI. Okay? My head pressure. My last, my last lake in the chain here is Agnew Lake. Agnew Lake was more of a meadow with a creek in it before we got here. And we made a dam. And the reason we made a dam there is we needed a waterway to build the upper dams. So I can generate off the Agnew Head, but it's much lower, about 80, 84, 8,500 feet. And it only holds about 850 uh, acre foot of water. It's not a lot. It's mostly just a waterway. Right back over here between these two concrete berms right here, you see a little space. Underneath that snow are some tracks, like railroad tracks. We have a little tram that's hooked to a cable all the way at the top. And a hoist house starts reeling up that cable and pulls the tram all the way up to Agnew Lake. It takes 17 minutes to go up it. We have a 10,000 pound uh, little tram that can carry quite a bit. And that's how we get abandoned materials into the backcountry to service our people. Um, after that, the top of this tram here, we have to go across Agnew with our barges. We have cranes up there that lift all our materials on the barges, go across Agnew to another train. And that train will take you up to Jim Lane. And we have another crane system in barges that will take you across Jim so you can get back to Wall. Is everyone talking so far? What's the elevation of Jim? Jim is, like, pretty much about 9,000. Nine thousand forty-eight. Um, I'll start passing this, uh, these pictures around. These are pictures of the water train system here, with the elevations, and everything, just so you can get a, a better idea. I know I always put something in my head when I can see it. Go ahead and flip it around. The white line is the pin stock. The pin stock is the big pipe which takes the water from the dam down the mountain to the powerhouse. What's it called? Uh, you'll notice uh, on uh, so this picture right here is of Jim Dam from Google Earth. It's a multiple arch dam. Okay. And the other one, Wall Dam, is a single arch dam. So two different types of dam construction. From the from the reservoir, from the dam. That's how we get the water down here. It doesn't come down in the creek. The reason is. We want to build that pressure as it comes up. We operate at about 800 PSI. The water's 800 PSI when you reach the bottom here. So 
there you you get about uh, 0.434 psi per one foot of water. So if you put your hand in water, one foot down, your hand is going to fill 0.434 psi. Okay, so two feet down, almost one psi. Makes sense. So if we're at 800 psi roughly here, how many feet roughly is it from here to Jim Lake? About a half, so it's about 1,600. About 1,600 feet higher. Than so we also have a helipad right down over here. We use a helicopter quite a bit to get up and down the mountain, inspect our dams, and that's how the hydrographers get up there to do their snow surveys. So we have a lot of, we try to get a lot of technology in here to inspect this stuff. The tram is old school. What we're moving into this year is using drone technology. So we do a lot of our inspections, not just outdoor inspections, but putting drones inside of our pin stocks so we can stop, uh, inspect the pin stocks. So it's pretty cool how that's evolving. So, who knows how much water we're going to have this year? Are we having a good year or a bad year in California? Good year. Good year. So, did anyone pay attention and watch what happened with the Orville Dam? Did you guys study that at all? We just looked. I mean, just we haven't talked it? about it in class. No. Okay. What happened at the Orville Dam? It had too much water. It had too much water, that's right. The spillway. There's basically two parts to a dam. You've got the intake structure, which is actually where you want to take your water and put it in the pin stock, and then it goes into your powerhouse, and then you got a spillway. The spillway is when it gets too full, it overflows, right? That's the one that failed. They got so much water, they have an emergency spillway, and that was the one just in the mud in the parking lot. So we're looking at, right now, if we don't get one more snowflake, we're looking at 181% normal year of water content. Um, at the beginning of the year in Tygo Pass, our hydrographers went up in January. On one of their spots of a uh, snow survey, there was an avalanche, and they couldn't get their a uh, snow survey pipe all the way down, but what they did get down had 65 inches of water content. That's a lot of water. And that was at the beginning of January. So we're going to have a really good water here. We do not own the water rights here at Edison with this water. We just have the privilege of generating with it. LADWP owns the water rights to this water. After it leaves our firehouse, it goes to Rush Creek, down into Grant Lake, they take it from Grant Lake, or excuse me, down to Silver, and then into Grant Lake, and then they take it from Grant Lake, and they send it on down to LA. All right, and I'm sure you guys cover how much water, do you guys cover how much water goes to LA, how much goes to the lake, is that part of it or no? We, no, we haven't talked about much of it yet, we got our okay. beginning of our tour yesterday. Okay, all right, all right. What are some things that you guys want to learn while you're here? I could talk on and on and on about this plan all day. I know a lot about it, but what do you guys want to know? We have three power plants here in the Mono Basin area. We also have another five out of Bishop for a total of eight power plants. Speak up. I don't know if you might know this, but the original engineer for it, do you remember the name of the head? I do not. Okay. I do not. Good question, though. Right? I don't even know if I can find an answer to that. Because okay. Edson goes through engineers quite a bit. You got a question? Oh, yeah. Last time, I can go and keep you doing it. Say again? Last time, I can keep you doing it. We just did a hundred year remodel electrically on, on the powerhouse. So all new generator leads, all new DC system, all new relays, some more of the electrical in the powerhouse. Uh, a turbine, that's the water wheel, the, where the water hits, a turbine will last about 20 or 30 years. We've just bought and installed, I have a picture of it somewhere here, I'll pass around, pass around. That's one piece solid stainless steel turbine, weighs 10,000 pounds, it's a little over 10 feet in diameter. And stainless steel is the most resistant metal that we can use against cavitation. Cavitation is your number one enemy in, in uh, uh, what do I do? Hydro. <laughs> do you want it? They don't know what it is. You want to tell them what cavitation is? We haven't talked about it. Cavitation, now you're really scratching my head. So cavitation <laughs> is when there's overpressure yeah. inside the turbine area. And somehow the water forms a bubble. Mm -hmm. Can you help me with this? 
-hmm. and then the bubble, <laughs> and then there's debris inside the water, right? And that bubble smacks the backside of the bucket and starts eroding the metal. It's like sandblasting metal in a way. Just excessive turbulence in the water, essentially, in your sandblast. And it doesn't, it's not where the water hits the turbine, it's the backside as it, as it comes off the turbine. So you wouldn't think to look on the backside of a bucket there, you would think to look where the water hits, but that's where the cavitation actually occurs. So stainless steel is the best metal we know of right now to use. So we are upgrading our turbines about every 20 or 30 years. These do have brand new turbines as of like four years ago. You know what? I don't know what kind of grade stainless steel they use. That's a really good question. I make the electricity man. So, you know what? Uh, we have lots of different disciplines here in hydro. I'm an operator. I make the things work, okay? I switch. We have mechanics and machinists. It's their job to know the metallurgy. And they go through and make all the mechanical stuff work and fix it, okay? We have ice techs, instrument control, and electricians, okay? Those are basically glorified electricians who are responsible for all the little wires and stuff like that. We have people called test men who are smarter than any of us. And they, <laughs> I swear to God. And they are the ones responsible for understanding our relay protections. And a relay, we call them relays. What it is, is it's, a, uh, it's like a computer and it's constantly looking at the electricity or the generator or out on these lines. We tell it where to look and what to look for. And it, it, it is analyzing the electricity one sixtieth of a second at a time or faster, okay? It will detect a fault, determine if it's out of its parameters or bandwidth, and decide to take action and open up circuit breakers to clear that fault. And it can, the fast ones do it in two sixtieths of a second, the fastest ones. I have a really slow one in Mammoth, it's from 19 whatever and it does it in about 22 cycles, which is really scary. 22 sixtieths of a second. Mm -hmm. So, does anyone ever travel to Europe? Mm -hmm. yeah. Do they use 50 cycles per second on your outlets? Do you have to get a little outlet mm -hmm. converter or something? Mm -hmm. Here in America, we use 60 cycles per second, okay? This picture right here that I'm holding up is of the field rotor. This is the part that you're going to see spinning we go upstairs, okay? Every little black block that you see on the rotor is an electromagnet. It's a magnet we make out of electricity, okay? It's not like iron or anything like that. It's, it's an electromagnet. One is positive, one is negative. One is positive, one is negative. Positive, negative. Those poles, we call each one of those blocks a pole, are going to pass by one copper conductor every 60 times a second. So that is our 60 hertz or 60 cycles a second. North America runs on 60 cycles a second. Europe does 50, so on and so forth. So that's why you gotta get a converter when you go over to Europe. One interesting fact about our grid in America, there's a western grid, an eastern grid, and then there's Texas. Okay? <laughs> Texas does not have inner ties to the western or eastern grid. They are on their own grid. And they did that on purpose so they could secede from the union without a hitch if they wanted to do that. So this is a pole, this is what a brand new pole looks like. On the other side of this picture, this is the stator. This is, has all the copper windings in it. Alright? So we, the field is the part that's spinning that you'll see. <laughs> the stator is the stationary part on the outside, alright? You can pass that around. So has anyone ever played with magnets as a kid? With mm -hmm. iron filings and magnets? When you spread those iron filings out on the table, and those iron filings make a loop around the magnet from one pole to the other, north to south, those are showing you invisible magnetic lines of flux. Magnetic lines of flux, okay? Those magnetic lines of flux, when you take those and you pass them through a conductor, like a copper wire, a voltage is induced. That's how you make electricity, it's that easy. So that's why we have a rotor with a bunch of magnets on it, spinning around making magnetic lines of flux, okay? And all it's doing is it's taking those magnetic lines of flux and constantly spinning them through the copper windings of the stator. 
That's how we make electricity, okay? Three, three phase electricity, there's an A, B, and C phase winding on the copper stator. Everything is solid copper, is it copper? Really good question. Yes, it is solid copper, but there are things we can do to increase the voltage of the unit. The greater the magnetic lines of flux, the stronger they are, the greater the voltage. One thing we can do to increase the voltage is wrap the copper in iron. So the copper has iron cores set in there as well. And that increases the voltage of the unit. Okay, simple physics. I don't know who discovered all this stuff. Somebody worked it out, it works great. Uh, one of the really unique things about this plant and the other two plants we have in the main motor basin, there's only one transmission line linking us to the rest of civilization in the SE grid. When we lose that transmission line, we're off the grid. The really cool thing about this hydro technology is that I use this plant and the other two plants and I can run isolated for weeks at a time without being on the grid. So while all you guys are out of electricity, <laughs> I'll still be nice and warm. <laughs> really cool thing about, the, about these plants, very unique thing. We go isolated probably once every two months on if there's a fault on the line or on purpose. Say they're doing maintenance on the line or something like that. So we use it quite a bit. We just had some fires this last uh, summer that took out two of my transmission lines up north and I used the plant to go isolated for seven days to make sure everybody had power while they repaired all the lines. So that's a really cool thing. The other cool thing about hydro technology, can anyone guess how long it takes for me to take a generator that's standing still to put it online and generate power? Anybody have a guess? At all? couple hours, 30 minutes. So it takes a steam plant a little over 24 hours to get all the, all the thermal temperatures up and all the systems running to generate power. I can do it in a little less than five minutes. Okay, so again, it's just old school technology. I'm putting water on a turbine, I'm spinning a generator. Really, the fastest thing is how fast I can move my feet. Or that's the <laughs> slowest part. Okay, so that's another really cool thing about hydro generation. Do you want to, anyone have any idea what kind of benefits hydro might give the state to, to everyone, anyone? Are there any benefits to having hydro facilities other than making electricity? Think of it, water resource management. It is clean power. Right, we can use the we do use the water itself off the pinstock for cooling systems. Come on, water resource management. Water discharge is more flow. More flow. Now you're getting closer. You're getting warmer. Well, I have an aquifer system put in place and all that stuff, so we just go into that infrastructure. Infrastructure getting warmer. Can I control the flows in the creeks? Uh, yeah, with the dams. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I can control how much water I put in the creeks. Can I mitigate flooding? Mm -hmm. That's right. Can we reserve water for late in the fall for the farmers and ranchers? Yeah, those reservoirs are like big banks where we can put water. That's why we have reservoirs. We don't just run off creeks. We want a nice big lake where we can store the water and use one constant flow all year round. That way everyone can have dependable water downstream as well. So hydro facilities also provide benefits to society as far as Flood mitigation, constant water flow, and very clean energy. Solar power is getting much better. The inverters are getting much better. But it's still dirty ass energy compared to hydro. Yes, SCE has just led the way in providing, we're working with Tesla and GE, and we just installed, I don't know if you guys saw, we just installed a huge battery system at a couple of our different stations down south. Tesla beat the pants off GE doing it. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, they put it together in like three months. It took GE like three years and they're still fighting over it. Okay, it was, it's really awesome. I think it's eight megawatts. What, did anyone see the article? It's a lot of power, battery storage. 
So when I have peak water right now, I'm at peak generation right now, but let's say there isn't peak demand on the grid, I, they can send that energy into the battery and then discharge it later when they need more power. Pretty cool. So SCE is one of the leaders in the nation. We're the ones who took the financial risk to start doing that. It's a really good question. Uh, one cool thing about hydro as well, I can generate all night. Can't do it with solar. Okay, 24 seven reliability. And because I got a reservoir, I can go up and down as load goes up and down. I've got my bank of water, right? So I can adjust with the with the load requirements or the demand. With the uh, draw, not with the less than heavy flow we had earlier, how much could you draw upon? Okay, so great question. I have two pin stocks that come down. When they reach down here, they're about 28 inches in diameter each. So I can only put as much water as I can fit in that pipe, right? So if I have my needles opened up all the way, which they are right now, I have about 110 CFS flowing through the plant right now. CF CFS is cubic feet per second. That's how we measure water. Do you want to know how many gallons might be in one cubic foot of water? Seven and a half gallons. Okay, so right now I have roughly a little over 800 gallons per second flowing down this creek. So that's not a lot of water compared to Oroville yeah. Dam. Again, we're doing 110 at full flow. They were releasing 110,000 CFS. <laughs> That's insane. I can't even comprehend that much water in my mind. So 110 CFS, maximum flow. Uh, right now, the reason we are, we do something really cool now. Did you know with alternating current, that's AC power we use on our light switches and outlets and everything, okay? You can't really store that energy. It's not like DC power like in your car battery, okay? So you have to use you have to generate as much energy as exactly is being used at that moment on the grid. Okay, that's why we, we have something called the California ISO, Independent System Operator. They work with PG&E, SG, or San Diego Gas and Electric, us, LADWP. Everyone is generating power and has AES. And they say, you generate this much, you generate this much, you generate this much, so on and so forth, okay? They award generation to power companies. And they tell us how much we can and can't make. Make sense? If we make too much power and no one's using it, it's called high potting the system. The voltage goes sky high, your lights get really bright, and then things <laughs> burn up. Okay? Yes. Yeah. How much anti solar insulation with the credits being taken away coming out and the big push behind the power companies? Because, well, V line must, but not battery uses. Is what made storage? Is there uh, any pushback or anything with that from the industry? Or no, uh, SE actually works very closely with, with Elon, yeah. and they're very excited about where the battery technology is going. One thing we're doing is we're discussing the power grid of the future. What does it look like? It used to be we would generate the power, send it out on the lines, and the people would use it. But now we have solar panels on rooftops little coach ends. There are four ranchers out of Bishop that have many hydro units on their ranches, and they send the power back in. So our relays, those fancy computers I was telling you about, we have to start telling them that it's okay to have power coming back in and going out, flowing both ways. It used to just, it used to just flow one way. So the power grid of the future is SCE is developing ways to enable customers I mean, Tesla's talking about a battery that's this big that can power your home. Yeah. It's badass. So we're, they're talking about how can we, you, because that would create less demand, right? Using solar, less demand on coal, less demand on hydro, we can save more water, so on and so forth, right? So they're talking about how can we work together to lower our demand of energy. So and that's one way to do that, is allowing it to flow back and forth in our grid. You guys argue for like national security too, with like reducing infrastructure and having more like home-based infrastructure. So there's not a grid to get shut down. Is that like grid security is proposal? a grid, grid security is a very big concern of SCE, and they, we we address it every day as best we can, prioritizing what are the 
uh, the most vulnerable and strategic uh, locations and assets that we have. So for like big overhauls, like to go from this to uh, like those Tesla batteries in every home type deal, to where we kind of get off the grid, is that... That's a question for the CEO, man. I have no idea. Is that even something to try and even, no that trying to even like, think about going towards? Or is that just like... That's what I was saying earlier, because a lot of the companies, like power companies, are pushing for making it tougher to get, but Walmart doesn't get that as a pushback, because they don't... Power use, they have the most control of it. It's a little more complex than that. Oh, yeah. So if you put solar solar panels on the top of your roof, which I'm considering doing myself, you can only generate during the day, and your meter, maybe you could spin your meter backwards if you got enough panels, right? You invest enough money. That's cool, man. That'll lower my bill, right? But I still want power in, at night. And if I don't invest in a battery storage, personally, I'm gonna be relied, relying on the grid at night, okay? So a lot of people are doing that. The question is, how do we, still fairly build customers for the reliability that they receive from us, all our lines, all our wires, all our relays, all our protections, all our reliability at night, even though their meter spins backwards and they don't pay for any of it. Does that make sense? SCE is not a charity, we're a business. So they're trying to wrestle with how do we lower energy demand have the power flow back and forth from the grid of the future, but also still make money, okay? So it's, it gets messy. Also, th does anyone know what VARS is? Volt amps reactive? This is called, a, this is called um, wattless power. That's a transformer right there. If I, I'm gonna try to keep this really simple, okay? There are watt, copper coils like this in it, okay? When you have electricity current flowing through those coils, it's building and collapsing magnetic lines of flux 60 times a second. But because they're coiled up, those magnetic lines of flux are passing through each other, which induces an opposite voltage, a reactive voltage. You cannot use that for anything. Is wattless power. You can't use it to, to, it won't power anything, okay? We have to have devices that compensate for that. You need the bars to move electricity, but you can't use it. That's where solar suffers, okay? The way we compensate for it up here is I have spinning mass. These generators, I can manipulate my magnetic lines of flux to adjust for bars, one way or the other. We call it bucking or boosting. It has to go negative or positive either way, okay? Also, when you use a hair dryer or a pump, a motor, something that's spinning at your house, you're creating bars. That has to be accounted for. Somebody has to manage that. You need them to move electricity, but you also have to account for it and balance it out. That's as simple as I'm gonna get. <laughs> Okay, it gets, a little, it gets so point, it gets so messy, I, mean, I got testament telling me stuff, I say, all right, I'll push the IPZ button on that one. <laughs> because I, I can't get it. This is one of those industries you can never go deep enough. You can always keep learning. It gets pretty complex. So that, used to, I know where my limit is. <laughs> Jeremy is this smart, not that smart, okay? Jer Jeremy, so. can I have you talk about a couple things? Sure. One is your back. And secondly, why we're on the second story here, which maybe we're going to yes. stay inside. Yeah, but thank you for giving me back a second. All right, <laughs> uh, well, what about my background? What's your, how you got here, educationally? Okay, so I went in the Army, I got out, I was recruited by the Secret Service, they said you need a degree. Okay, so I went to school, I got a degree. When I graduated, I had a family, I decided not to go in the Secret Service. I ended up coming back up here where I grew up. I grew up right here in June Lake. I wanted to raise my boys up here too. Okay. So I worked as a condo manager in Mammoth and pretty much moved snow and threw snow and skied on it. It was awesome. Okay. This job kind of fell in my lap uh, when a family member called me up and said they were looking for some laborers. I heard they paid pretty good. So I put my name in, 
There was about 120 applicants, and through the test, SE is kind of hard to get in because they got a lot of tests that are really stupid that don't have anything to do with anything. <laughs> so I was hired as a laborer. They liked me enough. I was offered a full-time job after six months. It is a union job. I asked if I didn't have to be in it, and they said, well, if you want the job, you got to be in it. So I am a union worker. I pay dues to a guy who just takes my money. <laughs> And what was your degree uh, in? We won't. We, oh, so my degree is in communication yeah. studies. I went to Cal State Long Beach. I'm a state student, just like you guys. Um, and I eventually fit it into a apprentice operator job when I came up here. I got to come home, and now I'm working up here. So it's, it's a dream come true for me. But it took a number of years to get here. So that's my background. Uh, oh, this is a really unique powerhouse, and that's two stories. Story because LADWP who owns all the water down below was initially thinking of making their dams which are below a little higher so high that the basement would might flood so that's why they put the generators and built them up top on the second floor that never happened so that's why this is a two-story uh, building so it's kind of kind of unique for hydro generation um, so we could go inside and I, I would just Everything in there is live. If you touch a button or a switch, it will do something, okay? So I want to just be able to manage about half of you at a time. So please don't take offense to that. It's my job in line. Okay, so I'm going to take half of you up into the control room. I'll just point out what you're looking at on the, on the floor. You can go and take a look at it. I know some of you already took pictures. I forgot to tell you, please don't take pictures in the plant. It's against company policy. Don't put them online. There are things security-wise the company doesn't want bad people to see. Okay? So just don't put them on social media. Show your friends and your family. Don't put them on social media, though. So, honestly, there's not a lot in there that's going to be Can't put them anywhere. It's old camps. Okay. They have a damn in Mosul with high school degree. So I'll take half of you up. We'll go up the stairs. We're going to go immediately into the control room. In the control room, you'll see some stainless steel boards with lights and switches. I ask that you just stay away from that, okay? Everyone know what to stay away from? Everything. Control board Everything. with the lights and switches. Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> Everything. And, yeah. and if you have a backpack, just be careful. You've got extra depth to your body here. So if you're backing up, you might hit something. All right, let's take half of you guys up. This is so 